It's great to see you all today. I have a message for the entire church family. Okay, so some are watching me uh, online or maybe you're watching uh, on the screen or something like that. But uh, got a message for everybody today. Uh, you, you chose well, by the way. Uh, a lot of people traveling. I understand there's about 600 flights that were canceled yesterday. And if you can find your luggage, that's always helpful if you're going somewhere. But uh, lots of craziness happening this weekend, but I hope you have a great weekend. I'm ready to just chill a bit tomorrow. Uh, we're not going anywhere. We're just going to relax and have a great, a great day. I hope you will have the same. I was traveling not too many uh, years ago. Um, I was leaving here, in fact, on a Wednesday night and going to Houston. And I, was, I was, had a busy day. I was rushing around and got over to Love Field, jumped on the plane, and uh, was meeting up with Stacy uh, down in Houston. And and uh, we're flying along, just cruising along, and, and I'm reading a book. And the, um, the pilot comes on, as they do, and he says, so uh, we're about to make our descent into Harlingen. And I'm reading, literally, I'm reading, I'm going, Whoa. And my mind just started racing, like, wait, wait. No, I'm going to Houston. That, how could it? No, I couldn't. No, I had a ticket. There's no way I'm on the wrong flight. And my mind was just like, what? And then... He says, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, we're going into Houston, then this plane's going to continue on to Harlington. And I was like, oh, oh, my gosh. I mean, for a moment, I was like, no. Because, and then I started to think, because this is how my mind works, I started to think that, okay, it's bad enough to be going to the wrong destination, right? Like, oh, darn. I mean, it wouldn't have been like, oh, shucks, not going to get to Houston, I'm going to Harlingen. Like, sorry, who wants to go to Harlingen? But... Um, <laughs> People that God loves and live there. They're amazing. I've been to Harlingen. But, um, but I'm going to Houston, right? So, but I, I started to think this. If, it's not just the destination's wrong. Think about this. I'm going to Twilight Zone one moment. Everything about the flight is wrong. Like I'm in the wrong seat. My seat, if I'm on the wrong flight, is on another plane. I got the wrong person sitting beside me. I'm supposed to be sitting beside somebody on another plane. I got the wrong steward. The flight attendant, that's not my, he or she's on the other plane. I got the wrong pilot. I got the wrong pretzels. These are my pretzels. <laughs> Mine are on another plane. Everything I'm seeing, everything I look at, the clouds, everything, everything is wrong. Not just the destination. So thinking, if you're on the wrong flight, Thinking that you're going to the right place and everything is right, everything is wrong. Thinking you're winning, you're losing. And in the same way in our spiritual lives, it's not just getting to the right destination. That's big, okay? But if we're, if we're not heading, and Jesus, can I say it, as our pilot, if he's not guiding our lives, then everything about our lives are wrong, Everything's wrong because the Bible says that we are totally, completely, we talked about this last week, depraved. We don't have the ability to do anything that is worthy of, of, of love and eternal life and all the stuff. We bring nothing. And what we're going to learn throughout this series in Galatians is what we say all the time around here. It's all about the gospel. It's all about focusing on him. And what I want to do this weekend on a, on a weekend, we celebrate our freedom uh, as we, we lean into this new series that we've entitled Finding Freedom in Christ. We're going to talk about what freedom really is. And this is so important in our day because people define freedom differently. Have we noticed this? I mean, there is so much going on in our culture today. And I'm going to speak to some of that and help us figure out how can we apply the gospel literally to every aspect of our lives, not just get to the right destination, but glorify God in the mix all the way to it and live in a way that he's called us to live. So go ahead and grab your Bible if you uh, have it with you. I hope you do. Galatians. Um, and if you don't, you can maybe find it on, your, on a tablet or screen or whatever. Don't, don't go to all your social media stuff and emails or something. But find your way to Galatians. And we're going to look at this uh, book. As we dive in, the first couple of chapters, as Paul does in all of his epistles, he, he offers um, the indicatives, which are you know, describing the gospel. What is the gospel? Then he moves towards how it's manifested. What does it look like? 
And then he talks about how it's empowered or appropriated in our lives, the last two chapters, where he then enters into the imperatives of how we live out this gospel. This is going to be an incredible series, by the way. This is arguably, I mean, back in the day for me, this was the, this was, this book's life changing for me. Uh, it's all about grace. And he, and he talks about what real freedom really is. Let me, let me start by saying this. Um, on a weekend, we celebrate freedom. Freedom, I'd say it this way, is not about doing whatever you want to do. That's, that's how most people define freedom. Freedom is doing whatever I, autonomous self, want to do. This is why we're in a lot of debate in our culture right now. Uh, as we talk about you know, First Amendment rights or free speech or, or decisions that I can make myself. Freedom is doing whatever I want to do. Biblically speaking, freedom is not doing whatever you want to do. Because there's this thing called sin. We are southbound, hellbound, apart from God, doing whatever I want to do. Give me over to that. I will self-destruct. Every one of us will. And we will not live for others, certainly. We'll live for ourselves by definition, right? Freedom is not doing whatever you want to do. Freedom is doing what you ought to do. That's something altogether different. And think about this. If you can't do what you ought to do, that's not freedom. That's bondage. That's the opposite of freedom. And Paul is going to tell us here in Galatians what real freedom looks like because we're going to today I want to talk about the paradox of the gospel. Okay, we talked about this a lot, the paradox of this upside down kingdom, but the scandal of the gospel is that it removes us all together. And we cannot quite get our minds around this. Again, we talked about this last week a lot. But but we said it this way. Here, this is the paradox of the gospel. You are more sinful and flawed than you ever imagined, and you're more loved and accepted than you've ever dreamed. At the same time, This is the amazing truth that separates the gospel from everything else in the world. No other religion, no other philosophy teaches this. This is all uh, just earth-shaking, mind-boggling stuff, and it is what changes our lives. It shapes the way we talk, the way we live. It, It shapes how we engage others, and the gospel settles what the win really is for us. And Jesus has won it for us, right? So throughout the, the, uh, the year, some of you are, are new here today, um, or first time, or maybe you haven't been here in a while, but throughout the year, we've been in the book of Matthew where we talked about this paradoxical kingdom, right? That we have a king, and, and the kingdom is where the weak are strong, and, and, and the greatest are, are those who are the least, the strongest are the weakest, you could say, the first are last, we said last week, and those, watch this, who are free are those who have become slaves to Christ. And all of this is so crazy and mind-boggling. We're going to unpack a lot of it today and throughout the summer. So I hope you don't miss a week. So we're going to talk about finding freedom in Christ. All right, we're in chapter 1 of Galatians. We're going to dive in. We're going to look at verses 1 through uh, 10. And what I want you to see here, here's the paradoxes I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Paul's going to teach us. We start by stopping, all right? Uh, we, we win by losing, And we live by dying, all right? So he dives in like any first century um, letter, which makes sense, a lot more sense than the way we we write letters. He says, Paul, this is me, this is what I'm talking to you. An apostle sent from, from, uh, not from men, but by, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ. He's saying, I'm an apostle sent by, which means sent, sent one. He's sent by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Okay, so multiple churches he's writing here. Then in verse 3, here we go. Grace, look how he's straight into it. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. Paul, bam, right away he's, he's gospel mode. He's like, this is all I've got. This is the good news. This is what we're all about. According to the will of the Father, God our and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And everybody said, amen. Let's go, Paul. Like, that's great. That's a great letter. I mean, that's the gospel. That's the center of our faith. And he lays it right out there. This is grace. It's all about grace. But then he immediately jumps into the problem. He says in verse 6, I am astonished, I'm amazed 
that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace, there's the word again, of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. He says, there's no other gospel, but there are those among you who are trying to throw you off. Now we know from history and we know through his defense in this book and all of his epistles, essentially, um, this group is what's called the Judaizers. They were a, a sect or a, a faction of Jews and some non-Jews who said, look, you do have to continue to follow uh, the Old Testament kind of laws, uh, particularly they believe like circumcision. You had to be circumcised in order to then become, uh, become a, a believer. You know, you're connected to the old covenant, though, yes, we're following after Jesus. Paul is arguing here that this addition or any addition by definition means you no longer have the gospel. Now, don't miss this. We talked about this last week. Anything added to the gospel, what Jesus Christ has done for us, his work for us on the cross, his death, his righteousness for our sin, the great exchange, anything you add to what Christ has already done is no longer the gospel. That's why Paul says there is no other gospel. But some of you are thinking that there is. So he first says, and this changed Paul's life as a Jew in particular, changes our lives because we're all prone, we've said it, uh, the default mode of the human heart is the law, performance, what I bring to the table. So Paul starts by saying this, we start by stopping, meaning we enter into this new relationship. This is mind blowing. This new life we have, freedom in Christ comes when we stop trying to achieve, right? Make our way to God through our good works. And Paul says, I've been on this works-based salvation, self-salvation train all my life. And this has radically changed everything. But notice he says too, look at what he says, his language. You've turned away from him. He's not simply saying you rejected a certain ideology or you're deserting a, a certain uh, set of truths or principles. You're rejecting Jesus because he's the one who's died on the cross for you. You're turning away from what he has accomplished for you. And he's going to say it in Galatians 3, verses 2 and 3 later. He's going to say, you're, you're trying to let Moses finish what Christ has started. Not going to happen. He says, Jesus is the better Moses. He's the one who's completed all the work. And last week, if you were here, we talked about this, that parable, the great parable in Matthew 20. Of all the workers, the, the vineyard workers who work all day long, some of them, some come later and then some come the last hour. And they get paid an entire day's wage. And everybody screams, it's not fair, unless you're the last hour worker. And that's Jesus' whole point. You and I are last hour workers. We've done nothing. And we get everything because the kingdom of God is not about earning wages. It's about God dispensing gifts. And so we, we said that in that parable, this is what Paul will talk about here in Galatians. There's a difference between justification and sanctification. And Jesus is taking us to school through a story reminding us, here's the truth. It's this. We turn our sanctification into the means for our justification. Even when we're saved, Paul's talking to believers here in Galatians. Even though you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, that you're saved by grace through faith, you don't believe that you're saved by grace alone. And so we're prone to come back and we just got to bring something to the table. We're just not good enough. And we live with guilt and self-condemnation because we think we're not being good enough when we need to come back to the gospel. And remember, wait, 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 wait. That's the whole point. I'm not good enough. Jesus is good enough. His righteousness covers me. And so now we are being sanctified because we've been justified. We've been made right because of Christ. And then that motivates me in everything I do, right? So we, we like to say it this way. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And that's really at the heart of this book. Paul says we start by stopping, okay? And this includes everybody. It, it includes the Jews. He says, everyone is saved through faith in Christ alone. And by the way, parenthetically, theologically, we, we call this, um, it, we, we say that, it, it, that the new has superseded the old. There's a, a theological term, supersessionism. You can impress your friends on the 4th of July. Um, it, or replacement theology. 
It's fulfillment theology, meaning that the, the, the new Jesus Christ, this gospel, not of works, but by faith, has superseded the old. And so the new covenant now comes in, not by works, but by faith. Everyone's invited, not just the Jew. Everyone comes to Christ and, and everyone can receive salvation through him. The church becomes the new and better Israel. I mean, just read the Old Testament will tell us this, that you can't get there by your good works. Read the book of Romans. Read his epistles. Read Hebrews. Jesus is the better one. He is the new uh, and perfect covenant now that, that God brings to us. But we're so prone to add to it, aren't we? We saw it in Africa. I've seen it in India. I've traveled the world. I've seen it in, in the Middle East. I've seen it in Asia. I've seen it in Japan. I've seen it ev everywhere you go. We are adding to the gospel because we can't handle the fact that we're so prideful that we, we aren't part of the mix. And God said, no, 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 no. It's a free gift and just rest in that. And then, here it is, live in response to that. Don't ever forget it. And it's why today, before we're done, we're going to share in the Lord's Supper together. Remember, 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 because we're prone to forget. And so Paul is teaching us the default mode of the human heart is a works-based salvation. And then watch this. He doubles down. Look at verse 8. He's not done. He said, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a, a gospel contrary... To the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Let him be damned, really. As we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So he's like, okay, Paul, you just said that. I know I want to say it again. I just, I can't say it enough. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant, the word is slave, of Christ. So like me, like you, like those of us who've received Christ, Paul is bound by the truth of this gospel. Changed his life. And, and he's going to hold on to it. And he's not going to give it up. And he's going to upset some. He's gonna, but he says, I'm not out to gain your approval. I'm out to gain God's approval, which I already have in Christ. And he's saying being faithful to the gospel means it's Jesus plus nothing. Not my good works, not a certain ideology, not my race, not my nationality, not my partisan political views, nothing but Christ is what defines me. And yet the past couple of years, we have seen uh, so many people in America who've made their partisan political views their idol. Now, I understand this if you're not a believer, right? That that's the way we're going to get things accomplished in the world. How else would you? But as believers, we know that we're part of another kingdom, this subversive kingdom that is in, infiltrates, and over all things. That Jesus is our king. We transform the culture in a completely different way. So if you're not a believer, understand, politics, you're idle. If you're a believer, that's messed up. And, and, and this is so challenging over the past couple of years. We've watched the church, God's people, be co-opted by partisan views, and we've lost our witness in so many ways. And we've got to get it back. And I'm believing that we can get it back. And listen, if you're a guest here today, you need to know this. We think deeply about this stuff here. We, we can I say it? We're an educated people. And we're not going to let social media or news feeds, you know, storm us and, and cause us to think this way or that. We're going to be more discerning because here's the thing. God's word is our rule and our guide. The word of God is, is our authority. We're going to follow the way of Jesus. I always say that. It's one thing to believe. It's quite nothing to obey. And that's where we're in trouble. We believe these things, but we don't obey and actually follow the way of Jesus. And I want to talk about this today, on this day, where we celebrate our freedom. And we still, we live in the greatest country on the planet. And I believe that with all my heart. I love living in America. I've traveled the world again, landing in Dallas at times, everybody cheering, we're home, right? 
we made it back. And, and I just, I love this country. But the way that we're going to transform the country is by living radical lives committed to Jesus. Because the political division in our country is only getting worse. As if it could. The past two weeks have been crazy. And, and I've talked to so many of you. I've talked to people coming I mean, coming at me, people dropping in on my DMs when I'm like, you know, I'm pro-life. What? You know, and jumping. I mean, it's crazy. Just when I thought it can't get worse, Roe v. Wade, all of this has created a rhetoric and a hatred and a disdain that, toward the other side that, I mean, I've not seen in my lifetime. And we've got to get clear, friends, about how we can engage culture. And we've got to be clear about the, what the actual win really is. We've got to. Or we keep pushing people away. We find freedom in Christ. We start by stopping. We are set free. We are loved by him. We can love others freely. But here's the second paradox I'm going to spend some time on here. We win by losing. Yeah, this will mess you up. This is the most counterintuitive aspect of the way of Jesus, of the gospel. And when I say the gospel, y'all listen to this. The gospel is, of course, Jesus Christ lives the perfect life, dies on the cross, buried, raised again. The cruciform life means I live the same way. Died to, so why we baptize. Die to myself. Now I'm raised up, completely forgiven, filled with the Holy Spirit. I now can live a new resurrected life. I say res literally resurrected heart and life. The cruciform life means that I live differently because of the gospel. It informs everything I do. It's why I, I, I live differently. I engage people differently. And again, it's where, you know, if we're going to really die to ourselves, at times we're going to look weak. But I'm going to argue that it's through that weakness that we actually, it's, it's, a, it's a function of trust. Do we really believe that the way of Jesus, not the way of the world, the way of Jesus is how we're going to change the world because we have an opportunity, gang. We have an opportunity. And as a church, specifically our church, I, I, people see us as different. Part of it, they can't figure your pastor out. That's part of the deal. Like, we don't know what's up with this guy. And, and I'm upsetting half the people half the time, Right? <laughs> And I'm going to explain why this is the way we ought to live. There's a third way. And why it is the way that, that God has given us a way that we can transform the culture, even this crazy culture. Um, Annie Stanley wrote a great book, a little book called um, Not In It to Win It. And uh, it's a really great book. If you follow, you can follow the Anne campaign. They do some great work. Um, where you can, you can figure out, let's be, let's be discerning here. There are nuances. And let's not let everybody on the news or social media or whatever else feed to us how we're going to act and respond. Instead, we're going to look at Scripture, and we're going to show the world that there's another way. Now, let me, let me just let me say this. We demonize the other side, don't we? And we're all prone to do this. We demonize the Democrats. All the Democrats, they're, you know, you see a little D under their name and they're on the news. Ah, lost and going to hell. Oh my gosh. Or we demonize the Republicans. If you're on the, if you're on the Democratic side, you're looking, ah, oh, those, they're ignorant and they're, they're all lost and going to hell. And if this is the case, and both sides say this, and some of us have that attitude. If that's the case, you say, well, that's right, Jeff, they're lost and going to hell. I mean, somebody ought to name it. Somebody ought to say it, you know. <laughs> If that's your perspective, watch this. First, you alienate half the people in our country. And secondly, if they're lost and dying and going to hell, wouldn't that make them the mission field? Seriously. I'm not playing. That means they're the mission field. And let me just say this. To have a disdain towards people that you're trying to reach with the gospel is a horrible evangelism strategy. It's a terrible evangelism strategy. This is why we've lost our way. People wonder, why, why are young people leaving the church and all this, you know, and we see all the stats and all this stuff. You know why? Not because we're not cool enough, not hip enough, because our music, our programming, they're leaving because we don't believe what we say we believe. 
We don't believe that the way of Jesus is actually this counterintuitive, upside down way to actually win people. We're not here to win arguments at all costs, meaning that we don't lose relationship with friends or family. I've had some, had some, some of this happen in my own life. We're, we're not going to lose relationships because of our political views. We're here to win souls at all costs, not win arguments. And, and, and Paul is going to teach us, though, there is persuasion, but persuasion begins with love. And the church is so divided right now. And, 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 it's, and it's sad to me. It's embarrassing. And we can do better. We can each do better. We can love people first. Jesus prayed in the, in the great high priest prayer, John 17. He didn't pray that we'd win it at all cost. He prayed we'd be united. And a, a divided nation needs a united church. And we, we need to be united around what Jesus has done for us. Now, you could, you could argue, but Jeff, didn't Jesus win? I mean, there's a win. Jesus was victorious on the cross. Okay, Jesus won. How did he win? By losing. By every earthly measure. He was an innocent man. No, better. Perfect, yes, completely innocent, holy, set apart. He is arrested, mock trial, trumped up charges, imprisoned, he's beaten, faces capital punishment, he dies a criminal's death. There's nothing about that that's winning. That is losing completely. And he lost intentionally. That's the way of Jesus. How do we do this? Let's talk about it. Because this is mind-blowing. Now, yes, you could say, well, no, he did it for the greater good, and he rose from the dead, and he won. He won, but he did so by losing. So what does this look like? Okay, look at Philippians chapter 2. You can turn there if you want, but I'll show it on the screen. Philippians 2 says this. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, just hang on to that for a moment. What if we had obeyed that over the past few years? Like, just obeyed that, that one and said, let's go there, gang. And then you're like, well, is he talking about like among in church or he's talking to believers? Is he talking about family, like best friends or roommates or people I work with? I've talked to so many of you who disagree with me politically. Who's he talking about? Is he talking about my enemies? Yes, 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 and yes, 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 yes. Look, he says, all things, all things. And then it says in verse 15, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Anybody? Yeah, those on the other side. They're jacked up, right? They're messed up. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that, here it is, in the day of Christ, I may be I may be proud that I did not run in vain and labor in vain. He's saying, listen, in all things, don't grumble, don't complain. And we're thinking, isn't that the American way? Like free speech? Is that First Amendment? I got a right to grumble and complain. I'm going to be, I'm, in, I'm throwing bombs at people. I am going to destroy. I'm, I'm going to just tear down. And the louder I can get, the better. Let me ask you, do you believe Jesus at his word and the word of God? And as your pastor, I'm convinced that we can, and we are, and we show a better way. That there is a better way. We're a different kind of church, friends. We are a people of grace, and, and we, we, we might bow out of certain debates or arguments at times in order to save the relationship. I'm not saying we don't speak the truth, but I've been in so many, I've been in so many you can imagine, so many conversations with people. I'm thinking, I could win this argument. Your argument is flimsy, it's reductionist, it, it, is, it is not logical, but I'm just going gonna, gonna to stop right here because I want to express a love and a grace, and I want to point you to Jesus right now. I want to talk about the gospel. I want to talk about Jesus. Friends, that's what we need to do. Be, let me ask you, when is the last time you argued someone into the kingdom? How's that gone? And on Facebook, you just people like, dang, that's a great point. I'm going to give my heart to Jesus now. People aren't doing that. Instead, they're going the other way. And we have dumbed down the social discourse that's going on, even Christians in America. 
And so conservatives seem to think that if you advocate for social justice, now it's a curse word, biblical justice, then you're a Marxist. No, that's reductionist. Or the progressive thinks if you advocate for sanctity of life, then you're embracing a white theology. You're racist. No. See, we need to think nuance, gang. And, and, and you don't see a lot of that in the media, by the way. Don't be tricked. Don't fall into it. Tim Keller, among others, listen to this. This is fascinating. Has noted that the early church was set apart because of five certain principles or beliefs that they practiced. Okay, more than this, but among five. Category defying um, principles. And see where these land. Watch where these land um, politically in our little partisan you know, framework of, of our day. At least five elements. First, a radical devotion. Early believers changed the world because of this. A radical devotion to racial equality and equity. A destruction of classism of a multiracial, multiethnic movement. Radical stuff. That sounds progressive. That sounds liberal. Secondly, they strongly devoted themselves to the sanctity of all human life. What I say from the womb to the tomb. They were against, they were pro-life, anti-abortion, anti-infanticide. That sounds conservative. Highly committed to caring for the poor and marginalized. That's what marked the early church, practicing social biblical justice. That sounds liberal, sounds progressive. And they were also revolutionary in regard to their sexual ethic. That we were created male and female in the image of God and that sex is to be between a man and a woman married husband and wife. Radical stuff. That sounds conservative. And then he says there's a fifth category. They were non-retaliatory, non-violent, even with their enemies, a radical forgiveness towards other people. That doesn't fit in any of our partisan <laughs> politics. See, each of these five, they, listen, they were there. Don't miss this. Christians believe all of this because they sought to submit to biblical authority. And if you'll do so, you will not align with one of our parties, not fully. And yet to give up any of these, Christianity becomes subverse, or sub, subservient to a political program. We can't do it. And I know this is complicated. You're like, well, Jeff, at some point you got to vote. I mean, you got to vote. Yes. But gang, let's, let's think biblically as we do so. And first, let's live out the gospel in front of people. Some of you need to like, I'm not going to talk about politics. I do want to talk about Jesus. See, here's the thing. Most of us are talking, we're a lot more passionate about politics than we are about Jesus. Than about the gospel. So in those conversations, let's talk about Jesus. Let me talk about why politics is not my primary thing in life. And we need more Christians in politics. I mean, there's so much I could say here today. But friends, if we want Jesus to be the one who guides us and the Spirit of God to be the one who guides our, works, our words and our actions, we're going to operate along a different path. It's going to be the way of Jesus. You're going to find yourself in the messy middle where I am because that's where we used to have dialogue. And that's where people will say, you're weak. You need to stand up for your convictions. One guy said to me, um, don't hurt yourself straddling the fence. I said, cute. Because the way of Jesus is going to find people are, you know, listen, how about this? Grace is risky. Just ask Jesus. Grace is, is a risky way. And people won't understand it. It's why Paul says, I'm not, trying to I'm not trying to gain approval of people. I got one that I'm seeking to approve. And I'll just let the rest of it fall. I'm going to love people to him. See, they lived radical lives, and we can do the same. And it looks like the love of Jesus. Now, look at um, 1 Corinthians 9. Before we're done, I want you to see this. Real practical teaching here. Because I've talked to so many. Like, I don't know what to say, Jeff. I don't know how to engage people at work. And oh my gosh, I talked to a family member. And this is getting crazy. Verse, um, verse 19 of, of 1 Corinthians 9. For though I am free, here's the word, from all. 
Paul was free. He was a uh, Roman citizen. He was, he was free. He was free in Christ. Though I'm free for, from all, I have made myself a servant to all. That's the word slave again. That I might win more of them. Look at this. There is a win. There's a win. And Paul says he's going to use his freedom in order to, he's going to talk about a strategy now. Okay? Not to shout louder. Not, but, but he's talking about persuasion. And persuasion begins with love. It begins with relationship. Real love. We're called to love real people, not ideal people. Real people. Look at verse 20. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win, there it is again, those under the law. Then he says in verse 21, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. Hang on to that. But I might, that I might win those outside the law. Six times he says there's a win. The win is winning souls to Jesus. Look at verse 22. To the weak, I became weak. That I might win the weak. Like you're going, this is not even the American way. No, it's not. It's the way of Jesus. And I should say, the way of many in, in American politics. Weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them, even my enemies, in its blessings. He reaches the lost by adapting his methods according to the group he's trying to reach. This is the principle of expediency. It's a principle of grace. Grace meets people where they are. And look at this. He's not being unethical. He's not being immoral. He is under the law of Christ. What is that? Love. Grace, that's the law of Christ. He's loving people for real. He is following the one who said in Matthew 16, 25, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We start by stopping. We win by losing. And then finally, we live by dying. And I'm gonna just lean us now towards the Lord's Supper together before we go. We live by dying. This is the gospel-shaped life that I've talked about. This is the cruciform life. Friend, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, here's what you've committed to. Luke 9, 23. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Start by stopping. We, we, we win by losing. We die to ourselves before everybody in our lives. We live by dying. In Mark 10, 43 through 44, he says, he says, hey, you know what? The Gentiles, leaders of this world, will try to power up on you. They're going to try to overpower you. They're going to, they're going to come against you. And then he says this. Listen to this. Not so with you. Instead, he says, Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Gang, do you, are you, this is radical stuff. Freedom is not doing whatever I want to do. Freedom is doing what I ought to do, and what I ought to do is obeying Jesus and living like him. Some of us have proven that politics is our idol. It is our passion. It is our thing. We will talk about it. We will argue for it. And we don't speak a word about Jesus Christ. It's time, friends. We can, we can do better. And I'm calling our church especially. We are a different kind of people. And I praise God that you are. I'm so honored to be your pastor. But if we're going to fulfill the Great Commission that we've been called to fulfill. We're going to follow the way of Jesus, who then goes on to say this. Look, he says, you're going to be a slave of all. And then he says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Friends, we can stop striving. We can rest in him because we live by dying. Amen? That's the way of Jesus. So what will you do? 
How will we obey? 